Shalom Alakim, Yisrael, peace be unto you. Yohanathan Dawid, we with you here, humbly so, on another edition of Yahweh for Hebrews and Christians. We, uh, we're going to continue in our Bimilota Shali series in his own words. This is episode number 45 of the Bimilota Shali series. Uh, we had to segue because of, of Tabernacles. Now we're returning on this is going to be released on the 15th of October 2023 of the year of their Lord. Now, as I, if you followed me for a while and we got over 300 videos, you know that um, basically this ministry is one where the focus is all about Yahweh Shua. It's not about the, the, the winds that change from the times and what's going on currently now, we are in a, 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 a chronic condition, a chronic condition of sin against Yahweh. And we do not delve into the, the political um, machinations that's going on in this world, the uh, acute situations that are going on. We're dealing with a chronic situation. Nevertheless, I will uh, just make a brief mention of what's going on now of this crisis that we got going on in, in Israel. Um, we know that Hamas, they are in this Islamic militant movement and um, in, one of, in one of the Palestinian territories, two major political parties that governs over two million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. We know that Iran is supplying materials and financial support. Um, I believe China is in there some kind of way. Tur Turkey harbors um, the top leaders. So, um, but all these things, there's always something going on. There's always something going on. We are supposed to be looking for Hamashiach and not worrying about the military unrest. He warned us about these things. He says these things are going to happen. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars. We are currently finishing out the uh, fourth seal and entering for the fifth seal. Waiting for that trumpet. We are supposed to be uh, focused on Yahweh sure. We And we should expect these things to happen, particularly at the appointed times. Hamas waited specifically at this time to do what they did because they know that it was time of tabernacles. We, um, throughout the history of the unrest in this Middle East, we saw some of the greatest events of all time have happened uh, on trumpets, uh, Passover, tabernacles, atonement, things, these things happen. And in our personal lives, in our personal lives, the greatest attacks come at the appointed times. Uh, this is nothing new. I remember reading the book All Eyes on Israel back in 1977. All right, 1977, when I was about 14 years old. Um, but Genesis 16, 12 tells us that Ishmael is a wild man. He's going to be against every man. And every man is going to be against him. And I believe this is part of Ishmael's uh, seed, this attack on Israel. Uh, he, and, and the record says he's going to live amongst all of us. He's going to live amongst his brethren. And Genesis 17, 20 says that he's going to be a great nation of 12 princesses. So these things are to be expected. Um, but we are not to be distracted. It's just like our, the movie, one of, well, a pretty good movie, the Titanic. Here the ship was sinking and we see the narrative. We have these two men fighting over this one woman. We got two men fighting over a, 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 a woman. And, and here the ship is sinking and they're still uh, running around. Uh, one man is trying to kill the other. They're fighting over this woman. Why the ship is sinking. So the world is falling apart. And, it's, and we've been told this. It's in the record. Are you still focused on things that do not lead to eternal life? Because salvation was in the boats outside of the ship. They had to get, on, get into these boats that were waiting them outside of the sinking ship. Salvation is in Yahweh, Shua, Hamashiach. And this world is sinking. It's fading away, Shaul says. It's fading away. It's going away. It is sinking. There's no 
salvation on this earth. The salvation is in Yahweh Shua. This is why Yahweh for Hebrews and Christians focuses on this. And today's topic is repent or perish. Shub umut. Shub, shub omut. Repent or perish. Picking up on the series, this is coming from Luke 13. And I did not plan this because what I just said comes from the very mouth of Yahweh Shua himself. And let's start off in Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. This was not planned. This was already the next uh, verse to, to, to go into. I'm going through, um, I did Luke 12 um, before this one and talks about how uh, Yahweh Shua is defying the temple authorities. And he's telling the uh, remnant, those who marginalized and disenfranchised, who are seeking Yahweh via the temple access, which is what they've been taught, and they're not being benefited from it. And they're holding the scribes and Pharisees up to a high level of standard because those are the ones who are teaching them the Torah, but they are misteaching them. And Yahweh Shua is standing up against them and she's teaching them to do likewise because they are misteaching the people. So he, he, he's teaching them to be without fear. And now we go into verse 13. He's saying, Shu omut, repent or perish. And this is what he says about a current situation. Just like what's going on now in the Middle East, something that's currently happening, a current crisis that has the world's attention. This is what he says. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So we got Pilate who's killing Hebrews right in in worship, right at a at a holy time, at a Kodesh time. And this is what Yahweh Shua's response is. And Yahweh Shua answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, unless you shub, you will likewise perish. You will likewise perish or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he addressed a current crisis that was going on in the community that they were concerned about and then he added another one just like we're doing here on social media it's all over social media it's all about what's going on with israel and hamas and the war that's going on over there now yahweh she was saying you know what is anybody over there less righteous than you is that why that's happening to them and i tell you no you need to repent or you're going to perish just like they needed to repent or perish it's all about me. And then, so this it seems cold and callous because lives are actually lost. Families are being hurt and destroyed. Children are going fatherless and motherless. This is impacting real lives. People who bleed, laugh, and cry, who had dreams and aspirations. But the cold truth is the soul is what is, needs to be saved. The flesh is nothing. Yahweh Shua said at his own mouth, Shali, in his own words, that what needs to be done by those souls is the same thing needs to be done by your soul. And that is to repent or perish, shub or moot. Then to uh, let this sink in, he teaches a message again. He goes into a parable, a parable that we call of the barren fig tree. To help cement this teaching, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let us alone for this year also till I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, if not, after that, you can cut it down. So here, Yahweh was saying, hey, you know what? 
Three years you have not borne fruit. The first commandment given to the creation was be fruitful and multiply. If you're not being fruitful and multiplying in whatever Yahweh has given you to be fruitful in, then you are to be destroyed. You are wasting your existence. And he gave this tree three years. He had mercy, had a seed for a fourth year, and it doesn't say whether this tree bore fruit or not. It leaves it open for judgment or grace. It leaves it open. Amongst Yahweh's shoe was 12 chosen. Remember, 11 of them came from Galilee. The place where these two crises happened. The only one that came from Yisrael, the only one that came from um, Judah was Yehuda, Judas Iscariot, who was a priest. And he was given three years under the tutelage of Yahweh Shua himself and bore no fruit. Three years of not repenting of who he was before he met Yahweh Shua. You who call yourself awake, the word out there is, I'm woke, I'm woke. Is Yahweh Shua the center of your life? Is he the focus of your life? Or are you distracted by all the things on social media? Are you distracted by what the current hot thing is right now? And that is your focus. Here, Yahweh for Hebrews and Christians, our focus is Yahweh Shua HaMashiach. And we're going to see how that is the only thing that's going to keep us from being deceived in these last days. Do not be distracted. Continue on in verses 10 through 17. The spirit of infirmity. Verses 10 through 17 of Luke 13. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Shabbat. And look, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Yahweh saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. So he heard the voice of her pain. He heard the, 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 the agony of her prayers, not the words, but he read her spirit and heard her spirit and he loosed her. But that was not all. It's a two-part process. And he laid his hands on her after he already loosed her. And see, it's a two-part process. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified Yahweh. She did not get straightened up because of what he said. He said what he said, which healed her in her spirit. But then he touched her to heal her in her body. There's a two-part process. Is accepting in the spirit, we receive Yahweh Shua, not for the benefits, not because we want what we want. We receive him in our hearts because we realize we, he resonates with our spirit. The second part, that was extra. That was the benefit of her physical body rising up. That was a that was a, 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 a ancillary benefit. There's a spiritual benefit. She was loose from her infirmity in her spirit. But then he laid hands on her and touched her and she physically rose up. And now she was free in her body. So here's a response from those who are the teachers of Israel, the leaders. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Yahweh Shua healed on the Shabbat. And he said to the crowd, so here you go, he's going to call, up, he's going to call out Yahweh Shua. He didn't speak to Yahweh Shua. He spoke to the crowd, it says, to the people who are amazed at what this man did, right? Now he's going to go ahead and grandstand. He's going to take and talk to the crowd, over, overshadow Yahweh Shua and talk to the crowd. There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on a Shabbat day. So here we go. He's going to go ahead and talk Moshe. That he's the teacher of the law. He's going to speak to the crowd and reiterate the laws of Moshe, okay? But the master then answered and said to him, Hypocrite! Does not each one of you on Shabbat loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for eight years. Yahweh Shua says, think of it. He told him to think on it. Sailor, think on this. For 18 years, he's saying this woman, be loose 
from this bound on the Shabbat? Yahweh was saying, you treat an animal better than that. You treat an, your own dumb animal better than what I treated this woman. On Shabbat, you don't let the animal suffer on the Sabbath. You loose them, let them go get a drink. And you said, I shouldn't lose this woman who's been bound for 18 years? Because it's the Sabbath, I'm going to let her go ahead and go another day and wait and come back tomorrow and loose her? So, and, and, and when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced because all of the glorious things that were done by Yahweh Shua. They were shamed. They were made sorrowful and shamefaced because it was acknowledged in front of all the people. Here they are talking about the law when, when Yahweh Shua healed this woman. They did not argue with him saying, yeah, uh, 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 yes, we, we treat our animals. No, we don't treat our animals like that. They knew they were wrong and they were shamefaced. They had no rebuttal. They had no comeback. Talking about uh, treating a, an animal better than this woman. Not only that, you know, <laughs> you know, y'all, she was perfect. But I'd be like, wait a minute. Well, you heal her. Why didn't you heal her yesterday? Will you be here tomorrow to heal her? If you're so right and so righteous and kodesh and holy, then you heal her. Why didn't you heal her the other six days? You're saying that she should be healed on the other six days, not on Shabbat. Well, why didn't you heal her on the other six days? That's the argument I would have came from. Y'all sure should came from the fact that, hey, you know, he didn't put him down like that. But you treat an animal better than this woman. She's a daughter of Abraham. Mm, mm, mm. The record says that they were put to shame. All these rulers, the teachers of the law, were put to shame. Once again, what we got is a good Samaritan act. A one who lives the law versus those who walk past that man who was half beaten to death. Those who were teachers of the law walked past the man beaten to death to go keep the law. The good Samaritan Helped the man who was beaten half to death. He practiced. He uh, demonstrated proper law keeping. This entire narrative. Now we're on episode number 45. Bimilata Shali, in his own words, is Moshe 1.0 versus Moshe 2.0. The proper application of Moshe is not against Moshe. It's the proper application of Moshe, of the law. The narrative continues in verses 18 and 19. Another parable. Yahweh Shua does something and then he teaches something. He does something physically and then he teaches you with the mind. Then he said, what is the kingdom of Yahweh like? And to what will I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in the garden and it grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. This is the kingdom of Yahweh. Being fruitful, being helpful. You bury a seed, it dies, it grows, and it benefits others. You eat off of it, birds nest in it, it gives life. This is the kingdom of Yah. Yahweh Shua is saying, this is the kingdom of Yah. It is not um, walking past a person half dead and going to the temple to call yourself learning the Torah. Conduct yourself the life of the Torah. Yahweh's words are, words are life and Yahweh's words are eternal life. And you live the words of Yahweh by how you conduct yourself with Yahweh's image, which is man is made after his image. How do we treat one another? That is the, 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 the unction of the Ruach HaKodesh. That is the, 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 the living of the Torah is how we treat one another. Did you get that message? Well, let's continue in verses 20 and 21 with another parable. And again, he said, to what would I like in the kingdom of Yahweh? So again, he's talking about the kingdom now. You want to be in the kingdom, you got to be like the man who planted that mustard seed. And grow and be fruitful. He's talking about the kingdom. 
He said, it is like laven, which a woman took and hid in the three measures of meal till it was all laven. Three measures. Yahweh sure was in the earth three days. He resurrected after that third day in the earth three days. A little laven lavens the whole lump. Yahweh sure resurrected and he lavened the entire world with the correct application of the Torah. He who has an ear, let him hear. Do you hear these parables? He who has an ear, let him hear. Let's continue. Verses 22 to 33. The narrow way. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. So now he's going, he's from, he leaves from that spot in Galilee, heading on to Jerusalem, along the way, teaching. And he said to them, and then one said to him, Master, are there few who are saved? So as he's teaching, someone says, wow, hey, this, is, this, is, this is huge. Then how many people are going to keep this? Only a few people are saved? Here's his answer. And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Because many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the mass of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Master, Master, open up for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you or where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we had ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Workers of iniquity, those who passed by the man had beaten and went to the temple to study Torah. Walk past the man who needed help. That is evil works. Walking past someone who you can help and not help them. He, Yahweh demonstrated with his hands, with his body, helping someone. He demonstrated this over and over again. At this point, two and a half years of demonstrating the law. And they knocked on the door just like those who knocked on the ark. Trying to get into the only way of safety. Knocking on the door after the judgment came. When the door is shut, it is shut. Don't knock now. Continue doing what you were doing before. Continue in your ministries. Continue in your self-righteousness. Verse 28. Y'all sure continuing to speak. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Yitzhak and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of Yahweh and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and, and the west, from the north and from the south, and sit down in the kingdom of Yahweh. And indeed, there are the last who will be first, and there will be first who are last. Yahweh Shua is talking about this in Ezekiel, is the combining of the two sticks. This is what he's talking about, coming from all four corners of the earth. The, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the remnant, the widows, the poor, the hungry, the lame, the infirm, those who have been imprisoned, he lets loose. These are the ones who have come from the four corners of the earth. Those who were cast out and cast off and put down and lightly regarded, disregarded, unregarded. Those are the ones who have come together that he's going to bring together and only he can bring them together. Those are the who will put last on the back of the bus. He said, going to be put first. So that means those who are first now, those who are on the top, those who are naming and claiming and blabbing and grabbing, those who will call themselves the teachers of this word, who are misteaching the people, the 666 commandments, those who are on top, who are looking fine, look, looking well-dressed and in their robes and, and their priestly and righteous gear, they are going to be made to be put last. This is not Yehonatan Dawid saying that Yahweh Shua says the first will be last and the last will be first. If things were in order now, it'd be no need for them to come. So obviously those who are teaching this word, who are heading up thousands, who has all the millions of likes and thousands of thumbs ups are misteaching the people. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. I am narrowly just teaching Yahweh HaMashiach and nothing else. I'm not getting all into, is it real? Yisrael and all what's going on over there. I will mention it. I will acknowledge it, but I will not be distracted by it. I'm teaching the narrow way. The narrow way. And it continues in verses 34 and 35. 
Oh, so let actually um Yeah, so it continues in verse 34, 35. O Yerushalom, Yerushalom, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, as hens gather her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and surely I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Here Yahweh Shua was saying, almost like exasperated. I'm coming to you. I'm teaching you. I'm showing you now here these two and a half years and you're still not getting it. You're still not getting it. You're still fleshly thinking. I come to you naming my father, trying to bring you to me. Bring you to me. I say, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Y'all walked away. But when I fed you fish and cornbread, y'all came. When I say, eat my flesh and my blood, y'all walked away. I heal. Y'all like y'all line up to be healed. When I, when I want to teach the narrow way of these words, y'all walk away. Oh, how I just tried to keep bringing you under my wings and you would not come. You kill the prophets all the years. You killed them. You hung them up. You strung them up. Every last one I sent to you early rising up and sending to you and you strung every last one of them up. You killed them all. Now I'm leaving you and your house is, is left desolate. And you ain't going to see me again until you bless me who comes in the name of Yahweh. That's when you're going to see me again. That is when you're going to see me again. And that takes me to the final scripture of what I to emphasize that in the so-called Old Testament that does not speak any differently from the New Testament. One is hidden and one is revealed. Psalm 118, 25 to 29. Psalm 118. 25 to 29, Dawid saying, Save now, I pray, O Yahweh, O Yahweh, I pray. Send now prosperity. Is he talking about sending money? Is he talking about we need more money, more money? No. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Yahweh Shua just quoted Psalm 118 in Luke 23, verse 35. Now here we are in Psalm 118, Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. So they mat, they mirror, they resonate. Old Testament with the New Testament. Yahweh Shua is showing us, shali, in my own words, the revelation of the so-called Old Testament of Moses. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the bed of Yahweh. We bless you from the temple. And right now there is no temple. The temple is you. If you receive him in your heart, if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you are his temple. You. It says Elohim is Yahweh. And he has given us light. What does the very beginning of the book say? Let there be light. It didn't mean physical light because there was no even sun created then. It means let the creation be full of the knowledge of Yahweh. That's what Or meant. Let the creation be full of the knowledge of Yahweh. That light, the light in the soul, not the light with your eyes. This is not physical light. And he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. That's Yahweh Shua. This is prophecy. Yahweh Shua is the sacrifice bound hand and foot. Bound willingly. Verse 28. You are my mighty one and I will praise you. You are my mighty one. I will exalt you. Here he is humbling himself to be bound. On the horns of the sacrifice. The one they say blessed is he. It was a week later. After they done praised Yahweh Shua and laid palms at his feet. Y'all call it this is the time of Easter. Holy week and all that kind of nonsense. The, a week after they laid the palms at his feet. At his feet while he was riding in on a donkey. A week later, he was strung up. And here, right here in verse 26, blessed he who comes in the name of Yahweh. And in the very next verse, verse 27, bind the sacrifice of course with, with cords to the horns of the altar. The very next verse. Talking about praising him and now sacrifice him. 
And then it says in verse 28, we bless you, Yahweh. We praise you. We exalt you. This is what has to be done for our salvation, for my salvation, for your salvation. Oh, Yahweh, may they hear this word with my 60 followers. May they share like this. And verse 29, oh, give total to Yahweh because he is told, he is good for his seed endures Olam. His mercy endures forever. That sacrifice had to be made. That little laven had to be, that laven had to be put in with three measures. Three, not one, not two, not four, but three. And he came after that third day. A mustard seed is buried, the smallest of all seeds, and it grows and bears great fruit. It's all about Yahweh Shul. It's not about what's going on currently today. It's not about the, so, the hot topic on social media. Yahweh Shul, Yahweh Shul, Yahweh Shul. We're going to continue in, in verse in this same series, the Tashali Shali series, in his own words. We're going to go to the next chapter of Luke. Until then, Shalom Alakim, peace be on you.